Magic the Gathering has changed quite a lot in the last few years, and no clearer example exists of this trend than the downfall of modern Jund. Once the dominating force of the modern format, the classic Jund value pile strategy has been pushed out of its throne room by the current modern meta. The gradual power creep towards more efficient removal spells that answer wider threats make Jund's one-for-one -one strategy far too slow for the 2023 metagame. All that being said, there is one last bastion of hope for Jund's triumphant return. I've been piloting a more contemporary take on Jund midrange in the historic format, where we have access to plenty of the deck's classic threats. Tarmogoyf, Liliana of the Veil, Thoughtseize, and Fatal Push are all legal, and we take some inspiration from Pioneer with the likes of Fable of the Mirror Breaker, Blood Tithe Harvester, Shielder the Apocalypse, and Kroxa Titan of Death's Hunger. To prove that Jun still has what it takes, I entered this deck into the historic metagame challenge in late May 2023. Can Boomer Jun return from the brink and learn some new tricks? Let's see how it went. We start our first match on the draw with a decent opening 7. We have Thought Season Blood Tithe to start, along with some more action once we draw some more lands. Our opponent starts with a land into Typhoid Rats, and we hit back with Hive of the Eye Tyrant into a Thought Seize. Judging by their hand, this looks like the default mono blacklist that MTG Arena gives to all players. In fact, upon further research, I found out that this is actually the Cold Blooded Killer's 2023 starter deck. Anyway, Demon of Loathing is ages away from being cast, so I take the Opportunist and pass the turn. Considering that I'm running a fully tuned historic deck against the stock standard intro deck, you can kind of imagine how this match went. We stopped our opponents in their tracks by consistently killing the creatures and attacking their hand with Liliana of the Veil. By the end, we managed to ultimate Lily, brutally making them sacrifice half their lands, and they knew there was no chance for comeback, so they decided to scoop it up. After game 1, my dumbass realized that this event consisted of best of 3 matches. I've only ever piloted this deck in best of 1 unranked, but luckily I had the foresight to add 3 ancient grudges to the sideboard. If anything, just consider this video to be an extra challenge and my gameplay to be extra skillful. The grudges aren't very useful in this matchup, so we'll just run it back as is. For some weird reason, our opponent lets us play first, and we have to mulligan 6 lands and a thought seize. Hand number 2 looks like it'll deal with our opponent's plans, so we bottom a fatal push and keep the 6. Our first few turns consist of playing lands and passing so on turn 3 I play Blood Tithe Harvester and create a Blood Token. They play Vampire Opportunist and we push it on their end step. Next turn we attack for 3, play a tap land, and start going for their hand with Liliana. They murder the Harvester and we draw Chandra, Torch of Defiance. With both Lily and Chandra on the battlefield, I'll have multiple sources of removal and card advantage, and there will be no way our opponent can recover from it. The only problem is that I'm missing my second red source, so for now I'm gonna have to wait to play her later. Our opponent plays Singer Vampire, so we kill it with Lily's minus 2. They play Savage Gorger, so we play Shieldred and kill Gorger with Liliana. They kill the Shieldred, but not before taking 2 damage from her triggered ability. Finally, we play Fable of the Mirror Breaker, giving us a treasure producing goblin. On our next turn, we make the treasure and cast Chandra post combat with our opponent empty handed. At least our opponent knows when to call it quits, and we walk away victorious. We're on the play for match 2 and we have to mull a no lander. Our 6 looks great and with no green spells in sight, we bottom the Beseju. We shock in a blood crypt and cast Inquisition, revealing our opponent is running mono white solemnity lock. I explained how this deck works in my Is It Phoenix video in case you need a refresher. Yeah yeah, shameless plug, whatever, whatever. The 9 lives is harder to deal with thanks to hexproof, so we discard that and pass the turn. Our opponent plays a land and passes, so we get to thought seize them on our turn, taking the solemnity. They play Starfield Mystic and we get them with a brutal Culligan's command, forcing them to discard a card and lose the Mystic. From from here we get them into a loop of playing creatures only for us to destroy them through removal spells and blood tithe harvesters. They eventually get a 9 lives onto the battlefield, but they don't get the solemnity in time, so we actually defeat them with their own cat enchantment. Ancient Grudge doesn't really help us here, so we're gonna run back the same 60 cards. We're on the draw this game, and we mulligan our 7 since we have too many high curve spells. Our second hand has 4 black spells and no black sources, so we have to mull again. We keep our next hand, putting Blood Tithe and Season Pyromancer on the bottom. Our opponent is first to the action, playing a good doggo on turn 2. We follow up with a Blood Tithe Harvester, and they play Heliod Sun Crowned in Past. Not what I was expecting from this deck, but at least it's not a lock piece. We Thought Seize them, removing the Enchantment Tutor Invasion of Theros from their hand, and swinging in for 3 damage. They play Hallowed Haunting, a great backup win condition for their mono enchantment deck. We get in for 3 damage, then play a tap land into Fable of the Mirror Breaker. They play a creature to get Heliod online, and then give the pup lifelink, so unfortunately we're forced to go Old Yeller on the companion. For the next few turns, we continue the tried and true strategy of clearing the board and attacking for big chunks of life. They finish by playing a Starnheim Courser, but we have the K command to remove it. Just like 6 9, they're not gonna let us get the chance to play it before scooping the match. Things have gone pretty smooth so far, but I'm gonna need some luck to get through the rest of this metagame challenge. You can help me increase our odds by tapping that like button and subscribing for more great gameplay like this. Now, let's move on to match number 3. 
We get to play first, but our hand is lacking early interactions, so we have to mulligan. Our six looks much better, so we bottom the spare Perilous Iteration and keep the rest. For anyone who doesn't know, Perilous Iteration is an arena exclusive digital card that draws us two cards, with the drawback of them getting discarded at the end of my next turn. Some players are very negative towards the alchemy cards, and I completely understand why, but this card is too synergistic to not include in the deck list. At least I'm not one of those scrubs that plays Crucis and Jarsil. Ugh. Anyway, on turn two, we drop a Harvester, and our opponent follows up with a Prosperous Innkeeper. We attack for three, leaving mana open for our Fatal Push. We get through, then decide to spend the open mana on a Fable of the Mirror Breaker. Our opponent caches in the treasure for Valakut Exploration, then plays one of the new Capenna Sacklands to trigger Landfall twice. They pass the turn, and Exploration deals two damage to our face. This deck went from being questionable to intriguing very quickly. We choose not to discard from Fable's second chapter, then Inquisition our opponent, taking the play with fire. They trade in their Innkeeper to block the Harvester, and take two damage. Then we cast Perilous Iteration to get a land and another Fable. On their turn, they get two more Landfall triggers, and luckily for us, they don't have enough mana to cast Felidar Retreat from Exile. We take another two damage from Exploration, but they have nothing to stop us from swinging all out. By the time they get to play the Retreat, we have a full board, and I channel Besaidu to remove it. They just couldn't keep up this game, so they scoop game one. This time we're on a draw, but we have a great 7 that we get to keep. We start by thought seizing them, taking the Valkut Exploration to shut down their impulse draw. They have no plays, so we get to drop a Blood Tithe. They kill it with a Sorcery Speed Rending Flame, which feels like a bit of a misplay on their part. We drop another Thought Seize, removing Felidar Retreat before it starts wrecking havoc on us. They don't seem to have anything other than lands in their hand, meaning that we're free to start dropping bombs on them. We get a Fable out, then kill an Innkeeper with Culligan's Command, forcing them to discard yet again. We continue to one for one them, slowly picking off their board and their hand. Eventually, Reflections a key he flips, and we play a 5-6 Tarmogoyf, which we can now clone every turn to drop their life total. They've had enough and scoop the match up, leaving us undefeated after 3 rounds. This deck is sweet. For match 4, we're on the play with a really painful, awkward opening hand. We're forced to mull to 6, and we keep the second hand, putting iteration on the bottom. We start off with an Inquisition, revealing a Goblin Lord and a Herald's Horn. This means that we're up against Rakdos Goblins, likely culminating with a Muxus. We take the Warchief and pass the turn. They don't have anything to play for a few turns, meaning that we can set up a Tarmogoyf and Thought Seeds away their Herald's Horn in the next turn. Our opponent plays a Hobgoblin Bandit Lord, which we swing past before casting Goyf number 2. They do have to block a Goyf on our next combat step, but unfortunately we're stuck on 2 mana, unable to play anything from our hand. Things get even worse when they cast Krenko Mob Boss, who can make an entire goblin army if it gets to untap. We get to swing in for a load of damage, but they top their curve off with Muxus, filling their board entirely for free. Sadly, we can't come back from this state, so we have to concede the match, taking our first loss so far. Now we're on the play, but our one land opening hand just won't cut it. Our next hand is slightly better, so we keep it and bottom the Chandra. We start off with an Inquisition, taking their play with fire. With this play, our opponent misses their scry trigger, and they don't have anything to play until turn 3. Following that, we get to cast Thought Seize to get rid of a Sling Gang Lieutenant. We get a Fable down, followed by our opponent dropping a War Chief. We kill the Haste Enabler with a Go for the Throat, then attack with our Goblin token to ramp into Fable number 2. On our next combat step, we have to sacrifice a Goblin in order to 2 for 1 them with Colligan's Command. And next turn, we set ourselves up for the double refer reflections of Kikijiki combo. We have a subtly sneaky answer to our opponent's Krenko when the third chapter of Fable triggers. As part of its ability, it leaves the battlefield and re-enters Transform, which means that Revolt is enabled on our Fatal Push. We swing in with a Goblin Token army and hold up our mana to finish the game on their end step. Facing down only a Skirk Prospector, we wait for our opponent's end step, and then we start using our non-summoning Sick Reflection to copy the other Reflection. This gives us a new Reflection that'll get sacrificed on the end step of our following turn. The new token has haste, so for each mana that we have available, we can repeat this process to create an entire army of temporary 2-2s. We proved to be the superior goblin deck by swinging in with our entire army for Xaxes. Moving on to game 3, I'm gonna keep this one brief. Once again we're on the draw with an excellent 7 cards, so we attack our opponent's hand and board by 1 for 1-ing them until we can stick a Liliana on the board. We're up in terms of card advantage, meaning that we can squeeze our opponent's hand until it's empty and destroy anything that slips through the cracks. We get to play Fable of the Mirror Breaker to apply some pressure, slowly growing our board by making copies of Season Pyromancer to draw 3 cards per turn. Liliana eventually ultimates, and after being stuck on 2 lands, we smack them down with our creatures. Game 1 was rough, but we managed to stabilize pretty well in those last 2 games. We start match 5 on the draw with a great opener, curving into the late game if we grab some lands along the way. I notice our opponent is playing Gigantha as a companion, which, in my experience, probably means we're against Izzet Wizards. My suspicions are confirmed when they play a turn 1 Soul Scar Mage. We get wrecked pretty badly by aggro, so we're just gonna have to hope that they have a slow hand. We cast Thought Seize, and since we have plenty of creature removal, we decide to get rid of the expressive iteration. They cast Balmor and attack for 1. We take out Balmor at sorcery speed with Go for the Throat while they're tapped out, hoping to avoid a spell pierce. They attack us for 1, then pick 
be the three mana to put Gigantha in hand, so we can't command to clear the board while the shields are down. We catch a break when they can't put a creature on the board, so we get Blood Tithe Harvester on the battlefield. They play Gigantha, but luckily we have the kill spell to deal with it. Even after clearing their board, they manage to pressure our low life total with two Den of the Bugbears, dropping us down to two life. We're starting to mount to come back near the end, but it doesn't really matter because they static discharge our face for lethal. On the play for game 2, we get an excellent opening hand, so we lead on Inquisition to get rid of Symmetry Sage. We manage to play a turn 2 Tarmogoyf that becomes a 4-5 before we untap. Sadly, we don't draw the removal spells that we desperately need to get rid of Balmor, and we get knocked down to 8 life after a few attacks. We set ourselves up for lethal on board, but our opponent gets blessed by God himself when they draw Reckless Charge into Wizard Lightning, stealing the game from behind to drop us out of the metagame challenge. <laughs> At least we make back our 2,000 quid entry fee and we get 5 free packs, which I'll open as the video ends. I'm very happy with the deck's performance and the results we got today solidify it even further for me. Overall our match record was 4-1 and one, and our game record was 8-3. and three. If you ask me, that's a pretty impressive showing for a relic of the old modern format with what only can be described as a diet sideboard. If you'd like to check out my full deck list, I'm going to leave a link for it in the description down below. Please don't forget to like the video and subscribe on your way out, and until next time, take care.